Good evening and welcome to this new event of Les Mardis des Sec, organized with the help of Maza, an audit and consulting firm, with a consulting firm specialized in augmented strategy, La Compagnie de Falsbourg, a real estate developer and manager, and the newspaper La Tribu. Tonight, we are honored to receive the CEO of Hermès, Axel Dumas, like D'Artagnan, the famous character of your namesake, Alexandre Dumas, you are a true musketeer who is not afraid to fight. After being promoted CEO in the midst of an epic family feud, you have guided Hermès International through a series of legal battles against your own Cardinal de Richelieu, Bernard Arnault. Born in 1917 in Neuilly-sur-Seine, you are the sixth generation member of the family that founded Hermès. In 1837, your ancestor, Thierry Hermès, became a manufacturer for European aristocrats and their horses. Still today, you keep making the saddles and riding equipments on which you have built your reputation. But ladies and gentlemen, your riding school will obviously need a very big budget to be able to afford even a single polo shirt. Your family still holds the reign over the company to this day, collectively owning 70% in shared capital and forming a large part of the executive board. Growing up, your mother held the role of managing director, while your uncle, Jean-Louis, was CEO. Your grandmother is said to have instructed you on how to protect the company while on her deathbed. Therefore, it was inevitable that your family has shaped you for the role in order to make you the fourth musketeer. After a bachelor degree of philosophy from La Sorbonne and a master of law, you graduated from Sciences Po and earned an MBA from the famous Harvard Business School. Before joining Hermès in 2003, you worked as an investment banker for Paribas in China and in the US. Thanks to the few contacts you had at Hermès, you climbed the ladder very fast. CEO of its jewelry division in 2006, and CEO of its leather goods division two years later, you took the role of CEO in June 2013. Your leadership has been considerably challenged, especially when LVMH, the biggest luxury conglomerate in the world, owned by Bernard Arnault, announced, to the surprise of your family, that it had built up a 23% stake in Hermès. However, as Alexandre Dumas would have done before, you fought the LVMH takeover attempt with both conviction and panache. You even describe the saga as the battle of our generation. To keep Hermes independent, your family gathered together and created a holding company where no one is allowed to share their shares for 20 years. One for all and all for one. But this intense family rift is not the only difficulty that you have faced. Like the three musketeers, you have another very dangerous enemy. Your milady is a paradox. Your company is fighting to maintain the allure of scarcity while, in the same time, pushing for an ever-increasing demand from Asia. During the time of mass expansion, Hermès has done a remarkable job at keeping the authenticity, the heritage, and the craftsmanship of its brand. Contrary to some of your competitors, you have grown bigger but not fatter. The reason behind this success could be the company in famous waiting list, which make customers who order an Hermes handbag wait up to two years before they receive it, and often people even struggle to even get on the list. Ultimately, true to your musketeer's ideals, when asked about what you would do in your free time, you answered that given the choice, you would go back to your philosophy study. Indeed, Philosophy is one of your hobbies that you will surely need when tackling the fundamental shifts that the luxury brand industry is facing. Le Mardi de l'ESSEC wish you a very pleasant debate. Monsieur Dumas, good evening and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, if you want, you may respond to the presentation that Maxime just made of you. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, um, we, we try to have a frank conversation. I, I don't do usually that, so I, 
I will. Uh, I like the relationship with Dumas. I have nothing to do with Alexandre Dumas, the, the writer. So usually, it's the custom people at custom who ask me, "Are you linked to uh, Alexandre Dumas, the writer, or the French minister?" I say, "None of them." I say, "Okay, open your bag." <laughs> Uh, but the, the other one of Duma that I love is that I say to my team all the time is uh, the, the advice that the mother of D'Artagnan said before leaving to Paris. He say, beware of your left and beware of your right. And I think there is a kind of paranoia that you need to remain in the business uh, all the time. Uh, I, I would just like to, uh, to, to precise something on your presentation, sorry, I, uh, because you know, I, I don't want to stumble on a fake uh, diploma. Uh, I was graduate from the A&P from HBS, which is the all for the old guy, and not uh, for your age at the time. So just for precision. Uh, I would like just to give you uh, one uh, one thing is that we are a 181 year uh, company. Uh, we are six generation, uh, and uh, and we are still making saddle. Um, Probably the saddle is our best price you can get uh, in the company because we are doing it for 25 hours uh, each saddle. And we have right now, and that would be one advice, we have right now a few uh, equestrian uh, competitor, uh, Olympic level that, that ride Hermes. And when I took over the, uh, the equestrian department, uh, we, are not, we are not having any professional rider uh, at the time. And I hope that's what we say. I, I say to the, to the team, I, I say, you know, if we are doing saddle just for, uh, because we did it in the past, just for the equestrian route, just for the image, uh, we are not right where well, you, you keep an image, which will be fine. So I say, or we go back to the highest competition level, or we close the thing, you know, we need to move on. Of course, no one wanted to close the thing, and eight years after, we've got uh, the Brazilian team uh, riding with Hermes. Uh, there is the um, Simon Delez, which was uh, uh, the best rider in France and in the Living Game. So I, I just think there is one thing that, that remains important, is, by the way, is to keep authenticity. Do the thing because you believe into it, and if you believe into it, try to do it the best you can. And it's not just a question of image, it's not keeping a, uh, craftsmanship as a museum, but you need to be alive and believe in what you do every time uh, and every moment in, in your job. Thank you. So we would like to divide this interview in three parts. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the identity of Hermès, then focus on what distinguishes Hermès from other uh, luxury houses, and finally we will discuss the future challenges. Then the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions through a Q&A session. So, thank you very much for what you said. Um, I will have one first question to talk about the identity of Hermès. So when you talked about this advice that D'Artagnan gave, is it an advice that you've had since uh, your very youth? Because just um, as a reminder for the public, so you are part of the founding family, and while well, your mother was production manager, as Maxim said, and you learned sewing at the age of 14, so you've been quite in the thing since the beginning. So was it evident since your youth that you would be the hair? Okay. Uh, fortunately enough, I'm the only one of the family here, because maybe there's lots of different things. I, I would say, first of all, when I was uh, younger, uh, I never, never thought about working for Hermes. I have to say, it was the thing of my mother, it was the thing of the family. Um, at the beginning of the century, uh, we had the exclusivity of the zipper for France. And when I was a kid, I said, oh, how stupid we keep Hermes and we don't keep the zipper. Because the zipper seemed much a better business to me uh, than the Hermes product. Uh, so it was something very far. And uh, I, after Sciences Po, they were, I was having just one dream, it was to work in China. And uh, so I asked a lot of, uh, it was 95, so it was not fashionable, and uh, I joined a bank because I was the only one who asked for it. Uh, and then I worked there for them for eight years, and I was very happy. And, uh, and then I, I've been asked by my uncle to join the company after my mother died, and I have to say, I said yes. But it was, I never thought about it, and when I joined the company, uh, I'm not sure I was the one they were thinking of to, to cover, and uh, so I was a little bit on my side and everything, which helped me to have a, 
a career which was more free than if everybody was believing into that. And now that you are CEO, are you already preparing uh, your future hair? Mm. Also, do you think do you think that ruling a mess needs a special formation that uh, that is started since your very young age? Alors, no, I don't think so. I think uh, first of all, uh, I will say. Uh, Hermès is a family, but the first family of Hermès is all the employees of Hermès. And I would say uh, that's very important for us. Uh, everybody joining the company, everybody working for a long time is part of the family. And some of the main contributors to Hermès has been people outside of the family. I'm thinking about Leila Menchari. Uh, I gave her the medal of 55 years of work in the same company. She was doing the windows of the Faubourg, and she was coming from Tunisia. Uh, did the Bazaar at Paris, and uh, she's the one who brought uh, color in the company. Uh, she's the one who, at the time, we were only doing black, uh, green, and our uh, red, Hermes red. And then uh, she's the one who said, ah, you need to have much more color. And we've got an oriental, actually, uh, feeling of Hermes, thanks to her. Veronique Nishanian, she's been, uh, uh, she, she's been doing our collection for 40 years now. Uh, of course, that's all people that are treated as family. They were all invited on my wedding. Uh, but also, the Hermes family is what you bring to the company. So I'm not sure you need to have uh, a member of the company uh, who directs Hermes. You need to love the value of Hermes. You need to have a family as owner who uh, supports Hermes. But uh, I think there is a lot of people I'm looking uh, to uh, what happened uh, in, in, a, in a near future, if I, if I die, or in a longer future. You know, it's part of the new rule of uh, governance. You have to have your succession plan ready. Uh, but I don't, it's not compulsory at all that it be um, a family member. That's a rule that you have to understand, is maybe at the same competency, uh, you can take someone from the family because he will understand better maybe the history or some kind of thing. At the same level of incompetency, you should never take the guy of the family because it will be much be harder to fire him after. And just as you, um, you talked about women, and it appears that all Hermes CEOs uh, have been men since the beginning, so are women not interested in running the firm? Well, <laughs> I am probably there as a founding family uh, because uh, Emile Hermès only had daughters. Uh, if, if probably if he had a boy, he would have given him the business and, uh, and we would be another branch. So uh, I would say there is a very strong link about, uh, about the woman and the education. What is true is that uh, uh, it took my mother generation to have women at the executive committee. And that was not especially, uh, especially the case uh, right now. So I, I, I feel. As a, as a CEO, I'm quite sensitive to the issue because my mother was really the working parent at home, more than my father, which was a doctor. Um, and that's something that we are very keen on, uh, on looking at Hermes. We are at 50% uh, 50 50 in our uh, supervisory board. Uh, we are at 60% uh, women at our operation committee. We probably can do better in the executive committee, but it's a matter of time. Uh, so it's something very that, that, that we need to uh, uh, to look at. But uh, it's true that a few generations ago, you will pass uh, the, the business from son to, to father, which, uh, in a way, we are lucky enough not to have that. So you've mentioned that it's not uh, necessary to be part of the founding family to, to be your successor. Uh, and indeed, Patrick Thomas was not part of the founding family. Do you believe that uh, your management style differs when you're part of the founding family compared to the one of uh, Patrick Thomas, for example? No, I, I, I really think that uh, when you join a company and you love it, and you're ready for the long term, so it depends. If it's just for your resume and to tick the box and say, well, you know, we love that, two years there, two years there. Uh, maybe you don't share the value as much of the company, but so a lot of people have been in the company for 40 years, uh, some 20 years, so they've got this attachment, and quite frankly, sometimes they know as much as you the value. They don't always 
know all the value, but no one, even me. Uh, I, I don't believe I'm here to tell all the value of Hermès to anyone. I've got a, there is a lot of people working with Hermès who know as much as me as the value, and uh, we like this kind of diversity. I love when the head of Taiwan called me and said, oh, this is not Hermès, Mr. Dumas, what are you doing? Uh, she's got a strong opinion about what is Hermès, sometimes different from me, and it's always uh, interesting. Uh, when I, uh, we don't work with consultant with Hermès, that's one of our particularity, we, we look ourselves deeply, but we, we don't look too much at the outside. And when I joined the executive committee, I could not stop it, but there was someone, uh, there was a consultant who was there to study the, the value of Hermès. And uh, so I was in bad mood, because that's exactly what I hate about that. Uh, but in all honesty, uh, the, the guy was great because he arrived and he said, you know, I, I failed my mission. I failed my mission, usually I need to find five values that are important, where we're going to gather the company around. At Hermès, I found 82 values, which are all important. Not all important to all your employees, but that I can't remove one of the 82 because it's very important to some of the key members of your family. So I think that's the beauty of Hermès. We have 82 values or 84. Uh, not this big, but, and people can choose and pick and all be there and it's about this diversity of view that is uh, the most important thing in terms of culture. And in, in your sense, what is the most important value? But, you know, everybody will have a, a different opinion. Uh, some will say it's craftsmanship, that will say quality. Uh, but there is one value and it, it can change with the next CEO, it can change with the, which I love is uh, freedom. I think there's a very strong sense of freedom within Hermès, uh, freedom of talk, uh, we are quite simple in a way we interact in internally, the freedom of uh, thinking, I think there is no taboo about, uh, you know, think. but there is two freedoms which are maybe uh, a little bit more different than in other companies. Uh, freedom of creation, we don't have a marketing department, uh, we, uh, we leave uh, our creator uh, almost completely free. And you have another kind of freedom, uh, uh, which is the opposite, but work well with it, is the freedom of pain. Every store manager decides uh, what the products are going to be in the store. Um, we are doing that right now. So uh, every twice a year, we bring 800 people, 49 nationality, important, important uh, where they see all the, uh, the novelty, and they pick and they pick and they choose. And sometimes the great creation of our best creator, no one buy it. And that's okay. So we have no marketing department, we have no merchandising, and I, I really believe that this freedom uh, of buying, freedom of creation, and freedom of thinking is at the core value of, of the Hermes success. Okay, thank you. Um, so others will also say that craftsmanship is one of the, the core values of Hermes. Uh, you give a particular place to craftsmanship. It is often valued among one of your success pillars. Uh, you invest a lot in it, you train workers in your workshops, and, um, and you buy more and more production sites, especially in France. Why does Hermès absolutely maintain its production in France? Oh, well, um, it's a little bit the leap of faith. Huh? I mean, it's not sure it's strategic in a way. I would say Hermès is a big asymmetry. You've got 85% of our production which we make in France and 85% of our product which is sell outside France. Um, I do believe that uh, when there is an history, when there is a culture of craftsmanship, it's better to do it in this country. And that's why for leather, I think France has an incredible uh, craftsmanship. We didn't invent, uh, by, the, by the way, we didn't invent uh, craftsmanship or Caspian or Saddle. They were there until the antiquity. What is funny is that we are probably doing the same way as they were doing. If you go to Saint Germain en Laye to the Paleotical uh, Museum, you will see needles, uh, and that's exactly almost the same that we are still using in our craft shop. They were done with bones, now it's done with metal, but that's probably the only difference for the way we are, we are doing the stitching. So I will say when there is a culture, when we have, like for example, three generation of craftsmen in our company, there is something special. And which is not only um, about, um, I will say, um, uh, repeat task, but about understanding what you do and have the pride, the pride to do it. So we do it in France, but when there was incredible printing in Nepal, 
we do it in Nepal and we are very happy to, ma to do made in Nepal uh, for some of our textile. Uh, for lacquer, we go to Vietnam where they've got a 2,000 year of craftsmanship there. For silk, of course, we do it in Lyon where there is a lot of, of silk things. So I think, you know, me, I try to find where the, where the craftsmanship is the more genuine. And for a lot of things, it's France, and which is not France, but we do it after. Uh, now, more and more brands develop around the Made in France business model. Uh, what is your outlook on this trend, considering that Hermes has been doing this since the beginning? We don't do marketing, so uh, you know, I don't think that Made in France is a, for some clients, maybe, and, uh, but we do it because we are proud to do it there. And, uh, you know, and I'm as proud to sell uh, made in uh, Switzerland for Swatch, for watch. I'm uh, as proud to say, as I told you, made in Vietnam for Alaka. Um, what you need to do is to be genuine and don't lie about the client. I have to say something else. Um, there is a lot of uh, discussion uh, with the government. Uh, should we be made in France? Should we be made in Europe? Uh, what is the level of uh, production? Uh, that I need that I can do outside, but still be made in France. Uh, I think when we try to do our made in France in France, started from the beginning in France, it's and in the France, and uh, that's the way uh, it makes sense. So you feel it's your duty to preserve craftsmanship in France? I think, oh yes, in a way, yes, duty. But I also believe that my bags are better done because we are in France and because they, there is this, uh, this history about it. There was one other thing where I, I believe that our bags are better done the way we do it, which is nothing rational. Uh, we, don't, uh, we are not in a terrorized mode. So a bag is done by one person from the start to finish, which is not the best efficient way to do it. We know that. Uh, but I think there is a special soul. There is a special uh, relationship uh, with your bag when you have done it. <coughs> from day one to the end. And actually, in all the bag, we know who did it. There is a number representing them. And it's uh, um, when we deem that the craftsman is sufficiently uh, skilled, we give him his number that he can put on the bag. And that's a very emotional, usually. Uh. Well, that's true. These bags are quite extraordinary. But do you think that uh, it's today an industry that is attractive to young workers? How do you recruit your craftsmen? Uh, it, it changed a lot. Uh, uh, when I did my first internship uh, within Hermes, we had 250 craftsmen, and we hired two craftsmen per day, per year. One was the best of the competition, the other one was best of the school, uh, uh, La Grégoire uh, in Paris. Now, every year, uh, we hire 300 craftsmen. So it's much different. Uh, it's much different. First of all, we cannot uh, hire from our competitor because they don't do the same job as us. So uh, the way we are working, uh, for that uh, is that we go in a region of France where there is unemployment, where there is a tradition of skill, uh, skill, and then we take all young people with school that we, we are linked to, or people who want to reconvert themselves, and we train them for two years, three years, uh, in order to do that. There is one thing that is important when we recruit, is that we don't do a uh, craft shop more than 250 300 people, because we believe that above that, it's not a craft shop, it's a factory, that people that cannot know uh, each one by their name, and so it's very important to that, so that's why we have 17 production uh, facility just for leather uh, in France. So you are training yourself, your craftsmen, because you think that the existing trainings in France are not adapted? Uh, it, it was, there was a big tradition of that, uh, there is still a few schools that we try to maintain and, uh, and hire them, but I will say that the level that we are asking for, uh, you cannot find. And I will say there is also less and less, because apart from us, there is less and less uh, employment for this kind of thing. So portion of our recruitment are done uh, through also uh, fashion school or people who know how to do the dance. The big difference between now and uh, 15 years ago is that uh, to be um, uh, to, to do the to work in the leather? Usually, it was 100 percent man, and uh, the, when I was a kid, it was only men. Now we are fighting to find men working in our in our craft shop. It's mainly women, and it's, it's and we have a very young age. I think the average age is around 30 now, so which is quite young for us. 
So you've mentioned that it takes around 20 hours to uh, craft a Birkin. Um, only by one craftsman who has at least five years of experience and a Birkin certificate. Uh, it takes sometimes six months to get an actual bag and there's a waiting list. Do you think it's a sustainable model um, considering the growing demand on the market? Mm -hmm. but, uh, it's a tough question. It's a tough question, but I will try to answer it honestly. First of all, uh, when we launched the Birkin bag, we didn't sell any of it. It was a total failure. In fact, a total failure. Uh, it was a small company. So you put the bags in the, uh, the craft shop where they bought the store, you, you produce it, you put it in the window, and you see that no one buys it. And that lasted for five years. And I'm always wondering, you know, if today we are still keeping give a chance to a product for five years before saying, okay, it doesn't work, let's forget it. <coughs> so maybe we have killed many Birkin uh, without knowing it. Uh, the second thing is that, and actually that, that's, that's a childhood memory. When it started, we were impressed by the success and we had 250 uh, craftsmen. So we were from day one when it started to see, overwhelmed by the demand. And my mother was head of uh, production and my uncle was CEO. And they were having dinner at home. And they were discussing uh, what, what should we do. And I can tell you that the metal was very small and we were ready to do any sale uh, about it. And, uh, and they look, uh, should we do that, that machine? Should we, do that, uh, should we have another supply chain? Should we do this? And at the end, they say, no, 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 because everything will change the product. So eventually, they decided, well, let the store decide. So there was no big plan about waiting list. I say, sometime I arrive, they say, oh, you are the genius who invented the waiting list. Um, actually, we just decided that we could not know, and every country decided their own way to deal with the other demand. So the French did something that uh, no one understood, even not them. Uh, in some uh, other country, it's difficult to say no to the client, so we had a five, six, seven years waiting list. And in the US, they are very organized, so they say that there is two years like, waiting list, after the two years, stop, and then. Um, so we received letter not asking to have a bag, but asking to be on the waiting list. So every year, I try to uh, to produce as much bag as I can. It's not that we are managing it. It's not that we are because you know uh, everything changes uh, every day. But I cannot hire more than 300 uh, craftsmen per year because above that, uh, I, I I cannot train them uh, enough. So the lesson I've heard it is to be true to yourself, try to be authentic, don't uh, crack on the pressure, it creates uh, issue that eventually will reinforce you. So is it inconsiderable to think that one day you will introduce technology in the manufacturing process? Well, there is something very special. Uh, I cannot say to you the answer with robot and, and what we are saying. What is uh, not discussable is that uh, hand stitching, um, uh, hand stitching is much better than machine stitching. So so far we are providing the best quality uh, as, as you can. When we have other way to bring as as much quality or even better, probably we'll do it because we are, I'm not a museum. We we change a lot the quality of our jewelry business. For example, there's been a lot of uh, of a new way of doing jewelry than uh, before, which are uh, better for quality. We allow you to have a much more precise uh, design. We took it. So right now, there's no technology at all in the crafting a bag in uh, Hermes. Apart the the Equestrian stitch, no, no, almost. And just. Why did the Birkin bag become famous after five years? What happened? Well, we never did an advertisement. We never did There was Jane Birkin. Sorry? There was Jane Birkin. She was. Yes. Well, you know, sometimes uh, you know, we, we're very close to Jane Birkin, and some people say, uh, you know, at one of her concerts, someone say, oh, why did your parents call you the name of the bank? So uh, it started really uh, end of the 80s. A uh, few clients say it's great, and then there was word of mouth, uh, and and there it was. So, well, as you said, the Birkin is here since the 80s, and traditionally Hermes used to reinvent itself. So you began with salary, and then horses were no more your first client, so you developed 
other leather goods and silk goods and so on. For example, um, in the 1950s, you started your own ready to wear collections. Um, and you hired uh, in 1998 the designer Martin Margiela, then Jean Paul Gaultier, and others. How do you choose the artists that will represent Hermès? Well, it's a, it's a question that we do with, uh, with our artistic direction. We need to have someone who understands craftsmanship, uh, I think, who believes in the value of the house, and we believe that it's going to be faithful. We try to be faithful to our designer, we don't change a lot when it's going well, and uh, we like them also to be uh, faithful to, to, to ourselves. After, it's a meeting of mine, and uh, I hope it, uh, there is no general rule. I think uh, Véronique Michelin is working for 40 years, Pierre Hardy for more than 25 years, and uh, Nadej, who is doing our ready to wear, uh, just for uh, three years. But recently you've changed quite a few. You've had also Jean-Paul Gaultier. Uh, have you not found the, the one person who's you know, representing Hermès faithfully? I think we've got Nadej and Lina, which is doing a great job, and I hope last very, and we have a very good result. It's true that for the women, it was a little bit more complicated. We had for years uh, a woman, uh, Mrs. Carolis, who did a thing. After we got like a pool of designers, Thomas Meyer was working for us at the time, and then there was Martin. Uh, we stopped working for Martin because he sold his company. It was part of the selling process that he worked only for, his, for, for the new owner. So uh, then after we called uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier because Martin used to work for Jean-Paul Gaultier. And we said, do you have an idea, any idea who could work for us uh, uh, because of that? And he said, let me think. And he called us back in the night and said, I've got an idea, it's me. Uh, so that's how we started with him. Uh, not again a very strong strategy. And then, uh, and then we've got Nadej, which we are working uh, very closely. So. When, when we think of Hermès, the word sobriety uh, comes to our mind. It's very pure, elegant, and minimalist. This is something that we can see in the ready to wear collections, but also in the runway shows and uh, in the marketing as well. Hermès has chosen not to market its brand too much. Uh, I think Hermès wants a product to be recognizable at first sight for its quality and not for, for its logo. Mm. Do you think that Hermès attracts a different clientele compared to other luxury houses? Well, I, I, we always, uh, you know, I, I think we, we, we think that when you use an Hermès product, you will get uh, smitten, and then you will, if you understand it, you will be part of the tribe. And I think the most faithful, uh, our clients are the, the ones who know better the company than us, and we are the, uh, the, the, the most uh, faithful that, that, that we can. Our goal is to uh, bring uh, as much people as we can uh, to, uh, to have an Hermes, buy, uh, an Hermes product. That's why we are the first one to open uh, in airport. Because we are not snobbish about selling or not selling, but we say, you know, people could be sometimes afraid or a little bit shy to come in an Hermes store, but if you they, they, in the airport you are not shy, so you can have a product, and after you say, oh, it's nice, I will come back. But it's still 400 years. <coughs> Maybe you cannot attract everyone. Of course, but um, you know, uh, our ties are not that expensive, our perfume are not that expensive, our scarf are not that expensive, some of our bags are very expensive, I uh, understand. Uh, so there is anything for, for an Hermes with that thing that costs you know, 50 euro and uh, you get a nice orange box. If you look at Instagram, uh, it's a very good way to communicate to millennials and uh, generally to young clientele. Um, Hermes Instagram page has 7.9 million followers against 23 for Dior and 32 for Chanel. Yeah. Obviously, we do not believe that Hermes likes, likes the means to move up the numbers. So is it a strategy or is your house not so attractive to millennials? Well, you, you, um, it's funny you say that, but thank you for the compliment. Um, <laughs> when I took over as, as CEO, uh, we were having uh, 50,000 uh, Facebook uh, follower friends, and I, I, I was l uh, talking with the head of, uh, of communication. We had digital, and said, "You say 50,000? It's not a lot." Huh? Uh, at the time, the, the, the hero was Burberry. Uh, we were talking very. They have three million or four million. Uh, he said, "Yeah, but it's the 50,000 that count." 
Uh, and I have to say, after this meeting, I decided to remove digital from the communication and to somewhat renew a little bit about digital. So we started very late on that. Uh, and it grew very much, uh, uh, almost by 50% uh, every year. Uh, uh, now we are a little bit stagnating at 8 million, and I think the, um, the issue we have is that we started too late, and now everything is almost, you have to pay, you have to do some other things which are not ready to do with, uh, with this company, so it's not that bad compared to where we are. So if it's a strategy for... I think for us, uh, you know, we have a very different uh, uh, communication business model than the rest of the industry. Uh, two thirds of our, uh, I would say, expenses are on uh, uh, PR, and only one third in media. So we do great party, we know how to lavish, and we don't spend as much as the other uh, in newspaper. And so sometimes we have less editorials. And I think that social media is the great thing to to make people aware of what we do in a parties or events in a much more large way. So I think it's really something we should do more and more and you know, we're working on it. And to attract this young clientele uh, who is usually on Instagram, you have developed other products such as uh, the Twilly, which is a cheaper and a smaller version of the silk scarf mm -hmm. and also the perfume that goes with it. Um, however, these clients are probably not the ones that would be true, loyal, as a goods and ready to wear clients in the future. So, can MS keep the strategy of developing another range of products for the younger clientele? Well, okay, we, we don't have a marketing department, so we don't ever uh, launch a product specifically for a clientele or, or an age or, or for that. And we don't have a marketing of price. So, all our price are done because of the cost of goods. Regardless if it's desirable or not desirable, uh, it's, it's done like that. After that, you know, millennials or age, it just really depends on the country. If you go to China, the clientele is much younger than anywhere else. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, with Japan, they say, Me, my, my strategy is pre generation of Hermes clients. I want to have the grandmother, the parents, and the children. Uh, and it works also. So every country is quite different. Every country has got uh, an age uh, different. And us, we don't try to do any product for, for that. But for the Twilly, the perfume, the advert is young, young girls dancing. So it's, maybe it's targeting a. Yeah, well, the way it started, we had a new nose because we are one of the companies which have got nose, Christine Nagel, and, you know, and she was trying to do her first perfume. And yes, we did that. We are, we are having a very iconic uh, perfume. We are number two, number three for men, and we are not as successful uh, for women. And we say, you know, try to find a, um, a woman perfume. And she came with his idea. There was barely a marketing pitch, and she said, "Well, you know, I see my daughter with a friend. They were playing with my uh, with, with my silk scarf, and you know, we should do it something uh, like that around, so something fresh from." from something new and she did it uh, on her way she did her way you know we didn't do any test before launching the perfume and you know she told the story to the to the uh, to the communication head and they said well let's have something about many girls not just one uh, ambassador and, uh, and we try to keep this fresh idea and well why is there no ambassador for ms control it to other firms uh, like Chanel and the luxury firms who have ambassadors and mm. you didn't have... No, it's a long-term strategy. We, we don't have ambassadors. Uh, we don't pay people to, uh, to wear our product. We are very happy when they wear it. And, uh, but uh, that's also about authenticity. You know, when you see people uh, having contracts with other brands and who ask you, you know, please, can you give me something? But let us buy your bag. And, uh, but don't tell it. And try to be discreet. And we are pleased. And you don't think that someone who is not representing your values will end up embodying uh, the brand? <coughs> I think we are not judgmental. I mean, everybody who can understand our product is more welcome and, uh, and happy to do that. I, I really think, you know, I don't want to come to your second part, but what will be the main different thing between Hermes and our brand? We are selling product. I'm not selling an image. I'm not selling the way you should look uh, or, uh, you know, you want to be like... Uh, Julia Robert, uh, buy this clothes. I say it's more. Uh, we sell product. I hope you like it or not, uh, and, and like it for yourself. 
Well, among your best products, uh, you made a partnership with Apple for an yep. Apple Watch mm -hmm. by Hermes, and it was a huge success. Yeah, yeah, so do you yeah. think that, well, <coughs> at first sight, it can seem quite different between Apple and Hermes. So do you think you are talking to the same clients, or do you think it could be um, well, an opportunity to get some Apple clients for you? Actually, both of us. I mean, uh, first of all, when you are in management, uh, you should never do uh, pronouncements that are too strong. Because when I started as CEO, I decided that we have no collaboration. That collaboration was really something, a dilution of the brand. And uh, one year after, I did the Apple Watch with Hermes. So, uh, a <laughs> few people make uh, fun of me a bit, uh, about that, but, uh, you know, it's okay. Um, the way we decided to do it. Uh, we had a meeting with Jonathan Ive. Uh, we, it's crazy because they are uh, obsessed with uh, Apple, with uh, privacy, confidentiality. Well, actually, they just give us a drink uh, in the middle of journalists uh, in a bar during Fashion Week. And we arrive and I explain him why I stopped all the, the, the collaboration. And he explained he explain me why Apple do, didn't do collaboration. And at the end of the day, uh, we are in quite the same view about that and uh, we decided for the fun let's do a product we like it we will uh, sell it we don't like it we don't sell it and actually it was a little bit like going back to the 30s when we launched the watch where we did the strap and also we did the design and it was a great collaboration with the artistic uh, studio of, of apple and we launched it uh, half in apple store half uh, in our store uh, it's true that uh, when we launched it the first day in Madison, uh, there was uh, more queue than we have to <laughs> in the morning, and not a lot than uh, usual uh, Hermes uh, customer. But I think it's fun. So definitely Hermes is a part, and this particular identity on, of Hermes is reflected on the luxury market. So you have amazing financial performances um, and iconic products, so you attract clients but also big investors. Yes, uh, in 2010, so LVMH announced that it owned 14% of Hermes capital and that it could move up to 17%. In 2001, LVMH started buying financial products from three different banks uh, called equity swaps, which made it cross the 5, 10, then 15% thresholds of ownership of Hermes unnoticed. And finally, they ended up with around 20% uh, of Hermes shares. What was your first reaction to this statement, and did you see it coming? Uh, there is the LVMH uh, SX share, so I don't want to, uh, to get good to, get to anyone. But, uh, uh, let's say it was a surprise, as you say. Uh, it was a surprise uh, um, for, I think, uh, everyone. Uh, it was a surprise for the market also, and it was a surprise for the regulator, because there was uh, an IMF uh, inquiry uh, after that. I think, you know, in all honesty, uh, I love Hermès and I com completely can understand why some people else want to own it or I think there is great potential and, uh, you know, you could change a lot of things that we do and have a great run of increasing the profitability for, for many years. That's what not we are doing. Uh, what was the main surprise also, and I think that was the surprise of maybe on the other side, is that all the family almost went there and, uh, and went there to protect their mess beyond their own uh, private interest. And I think that that was the, the, the great thing. But, um, so you are a limited partnership company, so that means that uh, the majority shareholder does not have control over the administration board. So what was the real threat of LVMH <coughs> being frozen at 22.6% of the capital. Well, you know, they don't take 23, 26% uh, of your company just for the fun of it and, uh, and not take control. And there is many ways to take control. Uh, this kind of partnership exists by the past. Uh, for example, Chateau Ikem was under this uh, organization, uh, under this uh, legal uh, status. You see where they are. So it's obviously not the only protection you can have. Uh, so I think it was, uh, you know, uh, it was very important for us to, uh, and we didn't do it for ourselves because at the time, you know, it didn't look 
uh, we we all thought that the stock price was too high and that uh, uh, and it was uh, you know 2010 it was a complicated year but after the financial crisis in 2007 but uh, I, I think that they all wanted to keep alive the value of Hermes and they believed they were uh, that was the only way to do it so your defense strategy was to create holdings uh, in order to gather all the family <laughs> shares um, and, and um, and create um, a united majority, promising not to sell any of your shares for at least 20 years. Mm -hmm. Have you changed anything else in the operation system at Hermes after this attempt? Well, for us, it's been very important, and, and especially for me, is that uh, um, this struggle, uh, SKI struggle, didn't have any operational impact. And actually, I was a little bit lonely with the executive committee because I tried not to have any decision or interference uh, with the rest of the company who were good enough to, to develop the business. So uh, the, the, the true answer is no. And, and now uh, LVMH has gone down to around 8% of the capital. Uh, do you think Bernard Arnault has given up on acquiring Hermes? Yeah. <laughs> it's not my job to read people's mind. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say, no, I, I, I will just will say two things. When I joined ICO, they were having 23%. Then uh, we find uh, a truth uh, where they, they, they went to 8.5% and they used portion of this share uh, to do their buying of Dior. So now they are at 1.9%. So now to develop more um, of perspective, so we'll talk about the international perspective of Hermes, which was developed by your uncle, Jean-Louis Dumas, and you first settled in China in 1961. So the strategy of Hermes is to open only a small number of stores each year, but still you are present on almost on mainland. For instance, in uh, January 2018, you opened a big store in Hong Kong, for which you signed in 2015. Mm -hmm when the luxury market in Asia was in full recession. So what makes your position special in Asia? I mean, the first thing I really believe in, uh, that's, uh, is that we, we, we started to be in a very uh, uncertain uh, century, starting uh, the 21st century. There is a lot of turmoil everywhere. I mean, the American army called that VUCA, uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And if you look at our, uh, at our worldwide, every two years, you've got a crisis somewhere. It started with September 11. Uh, two years after, there was uh, the SARS uh, in Hong Kong, a virus that almost stopped one of our biggest things. Then you have Fukushima in Japan, terrorist attack, financial crisis. Every two years, you've got somewhere uh, a country that has a huge issue and where things are blocked. So I think the first thing to survive in this environment, you need to have a balance a geographical portfolio. That's something we are very keen. The second thing, because you cannot predict why it's going to happen. You cannot predict that there will be a terrorist attack in uh, London, in Madrid, in Barcelona, in Paris, all that. Uh, and the second thing, so you need to have this kind of flexibility because you know after Fukushima, of course, we, it was a terrible year for Japan, and three years after, it was one of our most highest growing countries. So you need to be ready for having unexpected crisis coming there. And one way to do it is to have a balanced geography that's very important for us. So we are investing as much in our mature country, uh, I would say uh, Europe, uh, uh, we, we're going to relaunch, we just reopened our store in the Georges V, and also to invest in the new country and uh, a new place. And after that, you need, in terms of crisis, to be courageous and visionary. And it's true that in Hong Kong, we always believe in Hong Kong. Yeah, Hong Kong is quite amazing. And when there was this crisis, that was an opportunity to take a bigger store than what we are. And two years before, we could not get it. So it was a time to invest. Everybody told us that we were crazy. Uh, and maybe, you know, we don't always succeed in what we do. And this time, it did succeed. It's, when, uh, it's uh, our number four store in the world because it was really uh, transformational. Uh, but you need to take risk at and, and, and size the opportunity. And when you talked uh, about a balanced presence uh, in terms of geography, uh, do you have plans to settle in Africa? Because it's the only mainland where you are not. Okay. Um, when we open a store, we open it first of all for the local client. 
And that's different from some other brands where they try to think where is the touristy uh, crowd going. And us, it's very important to open, uh, I would say, for the local brand. And when we open also in a country, we want that they start to have a middle class. If you just open it for the rich people, the rich people, they travel all around the place. You don't need to open a store there and you don't want to be the only luxury place uh, of the world. So uh, I will say so far we did not open in, in Africa. The first country probably where we should open in Africa would be uh, South Africa right now, where there is to start to have a develop. And if we open it, we probably won't open it uh, in Le Cap. Uh, which is more touristy, we probably open it in Johannesburg. Now, after, you need to have a nice place that is set to your standard, you need to have a, a lot of things. So, I think each time we open uh, a new country, it be, and we never come too early, it's uh, because uh, we believe there is a middle class which is going to appreciate the product. What will change before that, sorry, will be digital. We're probably going to be, sh to be shipping in Africa quite soon with our uh, digital platform. Speaking about digital, um, Hermes was a pioneer with the first e-commerce website in 2002, which has been recently redesigned um, and it becomes uh, a digital flagship. In 2018, Hermes opened its e-commerce website for China, your first market, and on the contrary, many brands there uh, rather decided to ally with platforms, such as Alibaba. Burberry and Montblanc have done that, and with this association, they're trying to uh, attract Chinese youth whose purchasing power is increasing. Do you think Hermes is missing out on some clients with this strategy of exclusivity? Yeah, every decision that we take uh, has got some uh, reverse effect. That's something, but that's something I really like about the strategy and uh, Michael Porter. It's, uh, strategy is accepting to do something better than the other and accepting that the other uh, are doing something better than you. You need to pick your fight. And uh, I'm always a little bit reluctant when I see uh, uh, some of my team having a strategy where we do everything at the same time and great, and you know, that doesn't happen in real life. So you need to, to pick your fight. Uh, on the digital, we were really one of the pioneers. Uh, for the French who went to school, you know, we had to learn La Fontaine. It was a little bit like the horn and the turtle, the lièvre et la tortue. We started very fast, very sad, and probably we end up last. Uh, so you should, uh, and how, how, why did we start uh, first? Uh, because at the time we were discussing with my uncle, who was not working with the company, and Pierre Alexis, uh, the director, and we said, uh, you need to do something on digital, everybody's in digital. He looked at what everybody said and he said, I don't like what I see on the digital because I think they're talking about history, they're talking about culture, but that's, you should experience it, it's not well. What we are is merchant, so we opened our first e-commerce store in 2002, very small, in New York, just scarf, perfume, and ties. And then, we are so happy that we don't, didn't do anything. After we did a, a kind of, uh, uh, I would say, institutional site, but we wanted to keep the mystery of it. So we, did, we have something very creative, which was a kind of mosaic, where we believe that people could, will get lost into the Hermes universe. So the, the answer of our client was that they get lost, but they're not happy at all. And, and then we decided to do nothing, and there was a strategic decision before I was there, where we decided that mobile phone will be a fail and it will never work. So that doesn't help also to have, a strategy, uh, to have a technology that doesn't work on mobile. Uh, so I have, uh, when I took over as CEO, that's the first thing I will increase, my friend on Facebook, as you talk about, uh, and uh, we decided to mingle the seat and have just one side, and uh, who work on mobile. Uh, we had to sacrifice a few things, there was some aesthetic choice that we love, that we had to give up because to work on mobile, and we opened it in the, in the US, I mean, we opened it first in Canada, smallest market, if it failed, okay, did well, we opened it in, um, in the US, great success, we did it in Europe, and then we started with that to open it in, in China. Uh, and that was our first e-commerce site in China, compared to the US or Europe, where we already have the, the other one. Um, and what your question is, uh, the question that everybody was asking us, and that we were asking us among ourselves. And um, we decided, to be alone, at a time when nobody believed that it was, uh, it makes sense. 
one thing that uh, made me think that we could go alone is that our visitor and our store that couldn't buy was there was a lot already of Chinese and actually when we launched it uh, we didn't launch it very long time ago October 18 we um, we had a huge success I know so everybody seeing you can have it outside Alibaba does that mean that we're not going to go to Alibaba or in, in, in the future what is there is that we have a, an incredible success above our expectation to be frank, we hire someone for the logistic in China, for the, for the Amazon site, and we say, we told the guy, you know, don't worry, if you have just one order per day, we are a long, faithful company, we'll keep you there. First hour, it was 150 order. Uh, so the guy was in shock, fortunately you can hire quickly in China, uh, because he was unable to, do, to fulfill the order for the first day. Uh, so uh, it's a success. You should be always cautious. Uh, you should adapt your site to the Chinese market because yes, we are on our own site, but with your WeChat account, you can pay with your WeChat and everything. So you need, it's not exactly the, the, the same site, uh, but we were able to get the attraction and it's thanks really to the, to the beauty of the brand, uh, a lot of traffic uh, thanks to, uh, to our own name. So do you believe that the digital customer experience can one day replace the uh, physical experience in store? You have to think in terms of uh, game theory. I'm not there to decide. I mean, no, in a way, and that's something that frustrates a lot of my team, uh, is that I don't give them a percentage of sales that we need to do in digital. Yeah, they will love to have this target, they achieve it, I don't achieve it. Uh, because fundamentally, I don't care. What I know is that I need to have the best digital site uh, to, uh, to sell something compulsory, people are, uh, will go on the digital side. And I know that a lot of people love our uh, store. What I need to have is to have the two and let the client decide. And I need much more to have digital against the physical store. I need to have an omnichannel experience where people can do whatever they want. They can click in store, they can buy in store, they can look at the product, come in the MS store, they can be in the MS store and find the product. You, need to, you, you don't need to make choice for the client. You need them to have the choice, and to have a real choice, you need to be excellent in both cases. So now you have um, over 300 boutiques mm -hmm. in the world, and you also have digital. So do you think that Hermes has reached its maximums in terms of physical and digital presence on the market? Because luxury means exclusivity as well. I, I don't think so. I've, first of all, we are not... Uh, I, we don't believe we are a luxury company, sorry. Uh, we think we are craftsmen. We try to make the highest quality product. And, uh, and our day-to-day -day work, I mean, I don't want to, it's not luxuries at all. We are not, uh, we are working in Pantin, craft shop, so we are working quite a lot. But we try to make product that our client, with our uh, product, the client will have a luxurious life. And we are asking our client to have this kind of luxury. So, our strategy was not to expand because our production was not expanding enough to have so many stores. Uh, unfortunately, I can produce, uh, I, I'm, uh, there is restriction because of craftsmen, because of materials. Sometimes I don't produce because I don't have the right quality of, of leather. And in that case, we prefer not to produce. Uh, the, the last wave that we had was not to open too many stores, but have much bigger stores, like the Hong Kong one, in order to show all our metier. I talk about balance of geography, there is also a balance of métier that we need, and we are probably one of the companies which is the most balanced between the métier. Uh, and so we, we did a lot of bigger store, and I, I'm sure there will be a second wave where we start to open new, smaller store. Uh, there is a lot of things still to do in Japan, a lot of things to do in China. Uh, our st strategy in China is to open one new city per year. And uh, we did it uh, just this year with Xi'an, that's going well. Thank you. So now we'll head to our famous petit jeu. So it, it's just a few short questions and you have to answer with me. So to begin with, a first question, which Hermes scarf are you? I use the scarf C, Surf and Sun because being a CEO in your family is not easy and that reminds you to keep cool. Um, the scarf re revisited by Comme des Garçons because Japanese fashion is the future of fashion, and the scarf by Daniel Buren, 
or because your role is to preserve a tradition and to innovate. I will take the scene and so on. Not against the family. No, but uh, first, it's a, it's a scarf that, uh, that I like. It's a Brazilian, uh, it's a Brazilian designer that did it for us. Uh, and I have to say that when I was head of France, we did a, a soft contest for the opening of Biarritz uh, on the 20th of June, 2006. And it never rained on the 25th of June in, in Biarritz. Uh, and that was the worst storm ever. Uh, the, no one could come, and there was never a competition of, uh, of surf. And so, uh, as a tribute, they give me a surf, an Hermes surf, uh, done for the event that I carry still in my office of CEO right now. So, it's, uh, so I'm much more into uh, to that. The second one, I, I will say, I will also, uh, I'm against collaboration. So when they did that, I, I, I was not CEO at SL. You, know, you, you can find designer by yourself. And the Buren one, uh, yes, funny. <laughs> we need to pay for the Hong Kong store with it. Which, which exceptional product by Hermes are you? An, an Hermes skateboard, a crazy association of tradition and innovation that keeps you young and unstoppable. A customized Airbus 320, because even in the air you want to feel at home. And an Hermes yoga mat, because you missed your yoga class to come here tonight. I did miss my yoga class to come tonight. Um, we don't have a jet. We are one of the companies who don't have a corporate jet. So unfortunately, I can lost the middle picture. Uh, but we, uh, it's more for our client than for us. And uh, the, you know, I can surf and skate, but we do it to like wine. Which head of the family are you? <laughs> so. Are you cheaper by the dozen? You love your family, but sometimes you wish you were alone. <coughs> Little woman, you are a loving but absent father who left his family to make war against LVMH. <laughs> and Jeff Tush in the movie Les Tush, you give everyone in your family express his own personality as long as they respect your most important value, family. Well, during the day, I think I'm the three of them, very honestly. Très um, la is pretty, pretty much after a board meeting. <laughs> uh, little women, unfortunately, uh, I'm not very good at uh, work-life balance. And, uh, Les touches, I will take it as a compliment. <laughs> Maybe, I don't realize it as much as you. Um, <laughs> finally, which bag would you pick? The Kelly doll, because original doesn't mean beautiful. A unique Birkin bag, sold in auction by Christie's in 2017, made of gold, diamonds, and crocodile skin. So expensive that even our student loans combined cannot pay for it. <laughs> and finally, <laughs> Kim Kardashian's customized Birkin by George Kondo because it's absolutely, it's absolutely awful, but she is one of your best clients. Well, uh, very positive choice. Uh, okay, um, which, one do, which way do you want to go, from the right or the left? No, I, I will take the Kelly doll. Uh, it was designed by my uncle uh, to play for it. And uh, I, I will say two things about it. Uh, the, the last one, it was not made by us. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you can do what you want with your, with your bags. <laughs> um, no, but uh, quite funny, it's something that we, uh, we, we don't judge. Uh, you know, sometimes say, oh, are you, uh, I say, someone come in our store and buy something. I mean, say to him, thanks, right? don't judge him. And that's something very important that I have sometimes to tell to the sales staff. Please don't judge the people who come across the street, say thanks. Uh, yeah, in the, in the middle one, you, you ask a tricky question, because I told you that there was no marketing uh, of price, so we know we can send this bag much higher price, because in auction, it's brand new. Huh? In auction, you can have it for much more uh, price, but it's our authenticity to sell it for the same price, regardless if it's desirable or if it's not desirable. And uh, of course, we know that uh, some people are making a market out of it. We don't encourage it. You will find a cheaper bag as good in our store. 
Thank you. <laughs> so finally, we'll talk about the future challenges um, of Hermès. Chanel recently decided that they will stop using exotic leather. They have stated that they are constantly re-evaluating their means of sourcing of these raw materials in order to make sure that they meet their, the requirements in terms of ethics and transparency. What do you think about this initiative? Well, I would say uh, something. That's, that's a very important uh, subject, which is basically uh, how to keep to have the, the best materials around. And there is something that has been very, uh, I would say, uh, very dear uh, the, the last year, is that uh, farming has become industrial. And you see, uh, from on, on the, our own perspective, you see uh, the quality of the materials, uh, be it silk, be it uh, leather, going down. And we are fighting against it. Sometimes we are investing in, uh, in part of the industry where we, we are not. And it's because of, uh, uh, of the industrial uh, way of farming, which is destroying sometimes the landscape, definitely uh, animal welfare, and certainly our health when we you eat that. And uh, from our own perspective, when we look at what is going on, it's much less good quality than 20, 30 years ago. After, there can be very different issues between uh, farming in France, farming in uh, Mongolia, or farming in, uh, in other parts for, for, uh, for silk. Um, I think we are in an industry where we can do the investment, uh, of course, uh, to have welfare for the animals, to have the most efficient uh, farming. Let's say that most of our uh, materials that we use are the leftover. Uh, I, will, I will come to, to exotic skin, but you know, we don't, nobody raise, uh, actually it's a yak uh, raised in Brittany. Uh, um, a real yak. We find someone in Brittany who raised yak and is very happy about it. Um, we, um, uh, so it's, it was the leftover uh, that no one will use, and we transform, and uh, that the human intelligence that we transform it uh, with this incredible leather that can live 100, uh, 150 years. After that, uh, I'm not against farming, and uh, especially with crocodile, we are, uh, we, did, we, we are under the Washington Convention where it was almost an endangered species, and we, we did farming uh, to save uh, this species, and you have to release a few uh, uh, number of, uh, of it in the wild where they survive much better. Uh, you work with the local community, especially in Australia. So I think you can have a virtuous thing. The, the, the main thing is to, uh, is to remain on a sustainable uh, basis, moderate, and of course not too much quantity. And the quantity that we are using within Hermes is very, very small anyway. Um, consumers are more and more concerned about these issues and they look closer at what they buy and wear. There are lots of researches to find qualitative substitutes to leather. Uh, can we expect Hermès to follow this trend in a few years? Is it <coughs> inconsiderable to think that people could one day buy a Birkin made out of pineapple fibers? Well, no. Uh, I, I, I told you, I have not had... Uh, you know, it, we need to find the best uh, the best material possible. We did some uh, Birkin in, uh, in uh, felt, in Kashmir felt. Uh, didn't sell as much, it was quite nice. And we're redoing it this year because we love it. Uh, you, we use some, uh, some fabric, we do some uh, natural uh, uh, rubber at one point. The one thing that we want in our product, and that's what we be, it's product that will be able to age and that we can repair. What I love about an Hermes product is that uh, uh, you can repair it. We have granddaughter bringing the bags of the mother and we can still repair it and the leather is getting better and better with age. And I think that's also about sustainability. You don't uh, discard your product after one or two years of life and, and like that. So anything that will get, have a great durability, uh, which will be good for the, for the environment, we are looking at it. And actually we have some R&D trying always to find some new, uh, some new fabric. But we won't compromise on the quality and the longevity. You know, that's something very important for us, is that our product can be repaired. And it costs more uh, when you created it and when you constructed it to, to make a product that can be repaired 
<laughs> than uh, a product that you discard and, and, and you left. And that's part of the, of the beauty of it. I, I will tell you ju just a story about that, about how you use material. Is after the first, um, after the, the financial crisis uh, in 2007, 2008 in the US, uh, the price of gold went very up, very high. And we use more gold than anyone on our closing. And so the finance department, as they should, they come to us and say, why are you putting so much gold? Because they save uh, thing, and, you know, and uh, all that. And so I, I did a meeting. I was head of the ledger at the time, with OGG, which is there. We did a meeting, and we bring the finance department. It was uh, nice to see them. Um, and also I asked some craftsmen to be there. And I asked them, you know, why do we put? Does it make sense to put much more gold than the other? And the craftsmen said, listen, no one will see the difference of the quality. The self associate in the window, he won't, he won't see the difference, and the client will buy it. He won't see any difference about it. But in eight years, we'll have a better patina. And we keep it. And I think that's about authenticity and value. You keep the things so that they age beautifully. And so, still about um, CR practices that you have set up, we'd like to talk about your foundation, the Amaz Foundation. Um, so it was created in 2008 because, well, Amaz believes that Amuz uh, creators, so it has eight programs based on craftsmanship, creation, and transmission. So can you give us briefly the main activities of the foundation? Well, I, I think we are uh, a company doing well, and we are nice enough to say that we have financial success uh, in a world which is sometimes a little bit complicated. So it was important for us to create a foundation. Uh, where uh, basically every five years uh, we spend 40 million uh, euro. Uh, we got, I will say, uh, and we decided to pick a few subjects which are important for us. Of course, we uh, we support uh, creativity and artistic, uh, I would say, uh, uh, especially dance and theater because we pick where okay it was gesture also, but where there was no money usually. They've got a lot of uh, foundation for contemporary art. Uh, I think that for us it was important to give money to the artist who doesn't have usually uh, too much money. We invested a lot also, and that's one of our key things, into education. There's a real su a subject for education, and we did uh, uh, with the uh, Rectorat Paris uh, training for craftsmanship in school, difficult school, good school, garden school, high, uh, middle school, high school. So that's the second way. The third way is transmission of uh, craftsmanship. That's very important to keep the craftsmanship alive around the world. And fifth, uh, a fourth, sorry, fourth is uh, biodiversity. We're very keen on biodiversity, and we try to protect endangered species. And uh, that is the big main frame of what we do. Now, what we do something is that every year, every two years, we ask the Hermes uh, worldwide because we don't only want to spend on in France although most of it is in France, we ask worldwide our employee what will be the association that you want us to support. And they are, and if we pick up, we finance this association. On their side, they need to work for the association a little bit. So they need not just to like it, but they need to, to show their commitment by working and sometimes working with a team of colleagues. And with that, we were able to, uh, to finance a lot of associations in different countries, uh, meals for the uh, for the homeless in Singapore, uh, project with children in Hong Kong, uh, all of this, and I think it's very important not to be uh, too uh, centralized. Also, even on on, on the foundation. But how do you finance uh, the foundation? For instance, if MS revenue came to decrease, would you lower lower your donation to the foundation? Well, I think we can stomach it for a little bit, if I hopefully. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have another participant, the new CEO of Hermes. Um, I, I will say, you know, the, the way it works is you give a contract for five years. So for five years, it's secure. We just signed it last year for 40 million, and, and, and we go. And, uh, and I think the, the, the plan is more as, as we grow our education program, that is very uh, nice in France, we're probably going to increase uh, this amount more than reduce it. So. Hermes has uh, extraordinary financial results despite an unusual global context. 
Yet, uh, the Kelly bag was created in 1930 and the Birkin bag in 1984. Since then, there's been no, no other bag that's taken the lead, uh, contrary to other houses like Céline, with the famous designer uh, Phoebe Filo. Do you think Hermès is short of breath? Hermès, no, maybe me, because I mean, uh, the Kelly bag was uh, created by my uh, grandfather and the Birkin by my uncle. So, uh, maybe a few years before, I would love me to, to try to do something. Um, I talk about balance, balance of the métier. Uh, within every métier, I want balance of product. Um, because you never know what's going to happen. When I did my first internship in uh, 1988, you got your figure, uh, no, it's interesting, uh, silk was doing 55% of the business and leather 9%. Today, leather is doing 50% uh, and silk probably 14%. So things are going to move in 10 or 15 years. And I will say, uh, I don't know which product I'm going to sell best, but I know that I need to, maybe it would be perfume, with, with you think, but I need to prepare all this métier to, uh, to be ready for this growth. And for example, the two métiers which are having since the last three years the higher growth uh, are shoes and jewelry. Maybe the success won't be a new bag, it will be a better uh, a jewelry collection. And then, in every métier, I ask, um, I would say other product. And actually, if you look at the figure of leather now compared to five years ago, the portion of Birkin and Kelly is, very, is still very strong because we are selling it, but there is a lot of other models uh, that are doing very well, the Constance, the Lindy, and actually we are not actually relying too much on uh, a particular model, much more than now than before. And uh, you're part of the executive board of L'Oréal? Are you considering developing cosmetics in the future? Well, that's two different, totally subject. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad that uh, I heard that uh, you receive uh, Jean-Paul and that we are the only one who do it in English. It may sound French, but it's English. Uh, so, um, and I'm very close to it, but I would say that's a, another subject. Now, if we talk strategy about perfume, uh, I really believe that size matter, and that's something maybe that is different 10 years than now, is that you need to be a bigger actor to have your place, to have your own distribution and everything. I told you we are uh, quite good into, uh, uh, I would say, uh, perfume, men perfume, and we need to have another leg with the women perfume. If I really want to uh, simplify, uh, I would say the market on Europe is mainly perfume, the market in the US, mainly makeup, and the market, the market in Asia, makeup and cosmetic. So if you are not into the free uh, area, at one point you, you will lose ground and you won't be in a worldwide situation. So uh, you will see it in a few years, uh, but uh, yes, we are probably going to launch uh, makeup first. So you insisted on the fact that you're not a luxury house, but craft house. Um, and in June 2018, you entered the CAC 40 in place of Lafarge, a cement manufacturer, not really the same business. So do you consider it a symbol of the importance of, well, I won't say luxury, but you are considered as such. Uh, do you think it, uh, it's a symbol of the importance of things which are expensive and make the ordinary life extraordinary? I'm not sure that entering the CAC 40 makes your life uh, extraordinary, <laughs> at least when you manage it. Um, uh, the, the official, we, we did a press release when we entered the you know, It's not our decision, it's the decision of the uh, scientific committee uh, of uh, Oronex. That was a tribute to the strengths of Hermès and, and the big success. And uh, of course, we are happy about it, and we take it like that. Uh, we, are, we like to be discreet, so you know, if we, are, if we were not in the CAC 40, we'd be happy too. Uh, but now that you are, uh, it's better not to, uh, to exit it. <laughs> so, uh, that, that's something. I think, uh, um, I told you, I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, sometimes a complicated situation in France, and uh, if you, you need to have a, a worldwide market uh, to have the size that matter. And uh, it's true that uh, if you look at exportation for France and our current balance, uh, there is wine and there is a lot of luxury product. And that's also why uh, we are uh, having a large uh, turnover, it's because we are selling also uh, abroad. 
And so talking about the worldwide market, um, so you, Hermes is valued more than 48 times its benefits. And when um, Bernard Arnault went to the US, he met Donald Trump. So do you think that uh, you have a political role or that you could compete with um, the GAFA in terms of global reach? Well, if, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, first of all, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to say uh, they, uh, the, the, the French, we've got the coal, and uh, the US, you've got the GAFA. It's a little bit pretentious when you add uh, the market capitalization of all of them, we are quite smaller. Um, I will say, um, I will say I, you know, you cannot compete with, a, with some company which are uh, quasi monopolistic. You know, almost all your social interaction is under uh, Facebook and almost, almost all your uh, search is under Google. As we have many competitors, we have uh, different things. So I think it's really uh, a different uh, industry. Uh, I think we are m maybe we are living a, a Ricardian moment uh, from uh, Ricardo. I mean, you studied more than me, enfin, well, at least more than me, I don't know, but fresher than me. Uh, where country uh, tends to specialize in some uh, type of uh, industry and definitely because also of our uh, history of a culture we've been quite good to uh, to have uh, to have this kind of uh, I would say heritage house with a true craftsmanship. And so one last question before the Q&A session. Uh, so your predecessors have been known for either internationalizing the brand or developing new activities like ready to wear or perfume. So you accept the map. What will be your legacy for Hermes? Well, you know, if you look out of a management book, I will say the, the, the first one was the creative part, uh, definitely done by the, the, the first generation. Uh, Jean-Louis Dumas definitely did international. And the third one uh, is a kind of financial uh, management. Financial, I mean, on the shareholding side, that was the beginning. I would say uh, financing with the CAC 40 and probably looking at way uh, to consolidate for the future uh, the, the company. That would be my uh, my main task. Thank you very much for well, all the answers. Uh, now it's time for the questions from our partners, the Mr. Bonsoir à tous les étudiants de l'ESSEC, je suis Philippe Mabi, directeur de la rédaction de La Tribune et donc je voudrais adresser ma question pour Axel Dumas. Vous connaissez bien sûr les GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon et leur capitalisation boursière. Le secteur de la tech de ces GAFA représente 2700 milliards de dollars de capitalisation. Mais en France et au sein du CAC 40, on parle aujourd'hui, certains analystes parlent des calls, c'est-à-dire Kering, Hermès, L'Oréal, et LVMH, et ces quatre entreprises à elles seules représentent le quart de la capitalisation du CAC 40. On dit parfois que quand les calls éternuent, la bourse de Paris s'enrume. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de cette comparaison Est-ce que effectivement le secteur du luxe, ce ne serait pas un petit peu les GAFA euh, français Et euh, peut-être pour rajouter une dimension, parce qu'on parle beaucoup euh, de la crise économique mondiale qui pourrait arriver, aujourd'hui la Chine ralentit et on pourrait penser que ça pourrait avoir un impact sur le secteur du luxe, on a déjà commencé à le voir en bourse, est-ce que vous ne craignez pas que, effectivement, un ralentissement durable de l'économie puisse vous affecter, et comment comptez-vous y réagir Merci beaucoup et très bonne soirée. By comparing us to, to the GAFA, um, in 2001, uh, after the crisis, I wrote a note for my uncle and I said, you know, we should invest in uh, Apple, it's a great company, and we are having the same market capitalization. So, okay, we are in the CAC 40 now and everything, but <laughs> if I look to this own, I mean, Apple is much bigger than us and we probably did a terrible job on this year. Which means that we are, uh, we are uh, still all of us, we are much more smaller than that. Uh, maybe we are more stable in a way, because we've got our history, uh, the code, but um, we should remain, uh, we say, uh, humble all the time. The, the, the two things that I'll say is that, which is interesting, is that we are getting in a, in, in a there is two things. Uh, we are getting in a world where size matter. And actually, I'm very focused on growth, and I think all these companies are focused on growth, and there is more and more consolidation of the market, be it for the GAFA, 
bid uh, for uh, the coal. And it's much b difficult now to launch a smaller company than it was that it is now uh, before. So uh, that, that the first thing is that size matter, and so yes, there could be a consolidation, and yes, there could be a few companies that take like we not take all. And we are in a much more polarized world than before, which means before in the industry we were on the same average. Right now, you've got people doing very, you've got almost the same average, but people doing very well and some doing very bad. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you need to think uh, globally. Uh, you need to have uh, a worldwide market to succeed. That's the case of Facebook, that's the, the case of all of us. For China, very important market. A few signs of difficulty. That's for the macro. Uh, we all have the size to do to have a micro strategy that help us continue to grow in this market. So on the long term, I have no doubt. Thank you very much. So it's now time for the Q and A session. Uh, please raise your hand, stand up, introduce yourself, and ask only one question. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Clement. Thanks for coming here uh, in ESSEC. Well, my question is quite simple. Uh, I'm sure you have heard something about counterfeit products. Uh, are these counterfeit products dangerous for a brand like Hermes? And what are you doing in, in order to fight against these counterfeit products? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we are less, I mean, of course we have a lot of uh, legal uh, personnel in the company fighting comfort, counterfeit when they fight. I think we are less affected by counterfeit than other because it's quite very costly to do a good counterfeit of Hermes. I'm not saying anything for the others, but... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, actually the number of counterfeit are, are not that much. Uh, and. Um, and I, and I will say that our client, uh, they, uh, uh, they don't want to have a, 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 a fake counterfeit that can, people can see. So there is always, but not that much. We're fighting it. Uh, you know, I, I had this discussion when I was uh, with the leather department about fighting counterfeit, and there was some country, we are talking about Turkey uh, at the time, uh, having that. And, I was visiting Turkey and they say, oh, let's go with me, it was the head of custom, let's go with me uh, in, in, the, in the bazaar. And we were in the bazaar and say, look, look, look who's buying. Only Europeans. <laughs> Maybe we have a problem with that, but it's not true. And it's true that in a lot of countries, uh, counterfeit is not something uh, very much uh, used by, uh, uh, by some nationality. What I will say for us, the main issue and you talk a little bit with the auction, uh, is parallel market, people reselling. And when people resell for, more, uh, for a price which is more expensive than uh, the actual buy in a store, sometimes this, they, they have some bad counterfeit that they sell for a more expensive price, and that's an issue uh, for the client who believe because it's more expensive than in the store, then of course it's a, it's a, it's a true one. So that's something that we fight because that really deceive the client, and usually we re realize that when you come in an army store and say, oh, it's broken, can you repair it? And we say, no, we cannot repair it because it's a, uh, it's a counterfeit. I will give you one trick. We don't do uh, authentication certificate. So when someone say, oh, I bought on the internet uh, an Hermes bag with an authentication certificate, uh, it's a fake. <laughs> Even if it costs more than in the store. Good evening, sir. Uh, my question will take it back to the Hermes products and mostly their making. Um, you seem to be sensitive to the quality of the Hermes craftsmanship, and um, I heard, I think I heard it even so. Um, so the skills of your craftsmen are unique, and it's what makes Hermes unique too. So what strikes me is that those craftsmen at the heart of your firm um, are said to lack recognition, to not be paid enough, or at the height of their skills. So my question is, how is it, and how do you think it could be changed, or maybe improved, so that those craftsmen can be more valued in your firm? 
Okay. Um, that, that's a point of view. I mean, we, I will, we are happy enough to, to, to be right on Glassdoor, like the best employee of uh, um, our friends uh, lately. So uh, I, I guess there is some people who are happy with their mess because I, I didn't did all the click uh, myself. Uh, we don't have we don't have other craftsman population. A lot of people, uh, uh, I would say, uh, leaving us uh, and never uh, for uh, many reasons. It's very important for us to have a very strong uh, social, uh, I would say, uh, compensation for our thing. And that does go by two things. First of all, the level of, of salary is quite high. Uh, we decided, for example, because the year was good uh, in September, that every, craft, every employee of France was going to be um, get a uh, higher pay by 100 euros uh, per month, which was quite an improvement and you know and I think everybody was very touched and also we did mostly every three years um, um, uh, free share plan democratic where all our employees worldwide the 40,000 they get some share so a lot of our employees actually are shareholders of the company and benefit also from it it's a substantial thing so I, I understand the question but it's not a reality that we uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we have at, at our core the, the third thing I would like to say uh, about that, which is very important for me, is that we have been able to come to rural area where there is uh, usually no unemployment. And by opening a, a new factory there, uh, you open a new class for the children, you, uh, um, you are increasing uh, the real estate value, and uh, you give the, 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 the means for the public service to work again. Uh, if you want to have maybe a, a, another point of view, uh, I will advise you to go on our website and we did a, a film which is last seven minutes, which is not by us, it's done by a journalist who won the, the prize uh, at Berlin, about the mayor who, uh, of Montbron, so you type Ernest Montbron, we have a seven minute film, uh, who talk about what happened when an Hermès factory is opening there, and there is some uh, interview of, the, uh, of people working, uh, Picking their mind, and uh, with good thing and bad thing, but I, I think that's something that where we are very transparent and we are very proud uh, of this. If there are some people working for free generation in our company, I think it's because they, they believe they are respected on uh, every means. Thank you. I would first like to thank you for your time. Uh, the talk was very interesting indeed. I wanted to ask you, how do you motivate all your team members? Um, it's a, we, we spent a lot of time uh, trying to uh, give the culture and explain the vision. I think it's very important that uh, everybody in the staff understand uh, the vision and where you're going and why you are going. Because I think you need a purpose. Mm -hmm. It's complicated because uh, we are 14,000 company uh, people and I would say every year we hire 1,000 1, more people. And we are very proud to create jobs but you have to integrate these new people in the culture of the company. So there is a huge role of the HR about organizing seminar. Uh, I spent uh, every year we have a management seminar with the 50 uh, general manager of Hermes and every year I'm receiving all, all the store manager or all the director of Hermes or uh, creative or uh, craftsman. Um, you know. So I think it's very important to have the circulation and to do one-on-one -on -one meeting or uh, tonal meeting where you meet people and you uh, and you spend some uh, some time. It's very important to know what are you doing and why you are doing it. And I think we, we, we explain uh, what is Hermes at core, why we believe in craftsmanship, why we believe in creation. Maybe, uh, sorry, I didn't speak enough about creation. But we are first and foremost a creative house with success and with failure, and we accept the failure. Uh, I did some terrible failure when I was at jewelry, and that didn't uh, preclude the uh, jewelry to plus 50% when I was working on it. Uh, when you are a creative company, you take some risk, you redo it, and that's something that we always want to convey 
to, uh, to all the employees that for and foremost, we are there to help a creative vision make true. So if you like something very organized within Hermes and uh, I would say uh, almost uh, an engineer type, probably you won't be too happy uh, within Hermes. And so one of the way we try to motivate them is also uh, when they join. But if you understand chaotic, uh, if you are not afraid about paradox, and about people saying one thing and meaning the other, uh, and like creation, you probably will be very happy at Hermes because you will feel at home. My uh, question was about the uh, Hermes strategy. How the, because uh, this last year they talk about uh, a lot about the uh, future financial crisis. So my question is uh, how does Hermes take that into consideration in the strategy? Or how can, uh, how uh, Hermes usually uh, implement the strategy during financial crisis? Uh, well, we, if we talk just about finance, uh, there is one thing, uh, we almost went bankrupt in 29. Uh, Emile Hermes was a genius, in a way, he decided he, he went during the First World War, sent by the army in the US, and he saw only cars. So he came back, he was selling only to horse, uh, he, they were brother, one of the brother decided to sell. He kept the business and he tried to do uh, first uh, luggage for cars, then uh, bags for women and everything. So he was a great genius. He decided to open and put all our money uh, in 29 to open a store in the US. Uh, so in October, we were almost bankrupt. And, and since then, it was a traumatized. And uh, we were saved only by a supplier who decided to tell us, you know, oh, for Hermes, we we'll send you merchandise and you will only pay in one year or two years when you can. So some of them supplier, we still use them, again, because we are faithful to what they've done to us in the past. So I will say, in terms of uh, finance management, we are very cautious. And one thing that we have is that we don't have debt. So when it's the craziness of 2006, uh, 2005, I've got analysts who say, oh, it's terrible, Hermes, you are leaving money outside, uh, you have no debt, that precludes you from uh, uh, paying uh, ambassador, uh, opening more store. <coughs> and two years after, when there was a when there is a financial collapse, uh, people will say, uh, oh, wonderful Hermes, you have no debt, you are so wise. And, uh, so it's gone by a cycle, uh, nothing against uh, financial analysts, but uh, usually the same. So uh, right now we're in the middle of the things. You know, uh, uh, I think we have a very sound uh, financial uh, statement, and that's why I like to have uh, some cash. Uh, to believe that when there will be a tough year, we can still continue to invest, we can still continue to uh, uh, to grow the way we grow without having the pressure of the bank and without having too much the pressure uh, of the market. So we are, uh, in terms of cash flow, our cash flow are quite high and allow us uh, to um, to finance all our capex uh, directly and that's something I'm, I, I try to keep. I will say the way we split the cash flow is one third dividend, one third in capex and one third in cash uh, for uh, the more difficult uh, year. Thank you. So now uh, we have a cocktail in the cafeteria. This way. Thank you. Thank you.